According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word of the year for 2016 is post-truth. Do we now live in a post-truth world? What does that mean? That's the central question we're exploring in the 38th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. If you guys have been enjoying these long forum philosophic discussions, go check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Steve Patterson. I've just started putting up short, punchy videos that you guys will really enjoy. They're around five minutes long and they cover topics that I haven't talked as much in detail on this podcast. It's fresh material, so if you like Patterson Pursuit, you'll definitely like those videos. This week's episode is coming to you from Auckland, New Zealand. It is summer down here in the Southern Hemisphere, and so my guest this week was kind enough to meet me in the summer break for the Auckland University system. I'm joined by Professor Robert Nola, who's been teaching at the University of Auckland for more than 40 years. Our discussion starts where I like to start conversations at the very basics, talking about what is truth in the first place. Then we get into some post-truth discussion. We talk about faith and the methodology of religious thinking. And then we end up returning to the post-truth discussion by noting this interesting observation that those who are most loudly lamenting the era of post-truth politics seem to be those who just five or ten years ago were talking about how all truths are relative. The relativists, maybe by virtue of recent political phenomena, seem to have found their footing in objective truth, so we have an interesting discussion about that. Dr. Nola's work is in philosophy, and it specializes a great deal in the philosophy of science and the relationship between science and religion. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation with Dr. Robert Nola of the University of Auckland. There's a new term that has been gaining a lot of popularity. Just in the last couple of months, people are throwing around the term post-truth. And as somebody who's interested in philosophy, that's a really interesting choice of words. And so I want to talk to you about it. But before we, we talk about what post-truth means, I figured a good place to start would be to talk about truth itself. So questions like, what is truth? Is there such a thing as truth, objective truth? Is that, does, do those terms mean anything? So the first question that I want to ask you is just kind of definitional. What is truth? Oh, well, there's a <clears throat> very good definition given by Aristotle, but I hope I remember it correctly. <laughs> um, and he said, um, to say of what is that it is not, is, or to say of what is not, that it is, is to say the false. Whereas to say of what is, that it is, or to say of what is not, that it is not, is to say the true. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that's, um, <laughs> it's hard to get your mind around that, but um, if you think about it in this way, when he talks about a what is, it's a what is the case, or what is the fact, like um, it's the case now that there are two people sitting in this room. And if I said, um, there's one person sitting in this room now, I would have said the false on, on that definition. But if I went and said, there are two people sitting in this room, it's what I say, and, the, and the, the what is the case at the moment is, there are two people here, I'd have said the true. So I think Aristotle's definition um, <clears throat> is a pretty good starting point. And um, most modern theories of truth incorporate at least something like this in their basis. So, okay. Aristotle. So, when people use the term objective truth, then maybe that's a sticking point for a lot of people. Is, is the truth as you've described it, does that qualify as being objective truth? Yep. Um, so, let's look at this um, from the following point of view. You can s things are objective in the sense they would be the way they are even if you weren't around. Hmm. So, for example, <clears throat> If we weren't here in this room, if we suddenly dropped dead or never existed, there would still be this room. Mm -hmm. so, it, so in that sense, there can be things which exist objectively. But there are things which exist, let's say, subjectively, 
in the sense they require you to be around. So if you've got a pain in your left knee, let's say you're slightly arthritic, then um, you don't have pains in your left knee if you're not there to have them. Mm. So pains are kind of dependent on you. you. You could say they're subjective. So now the tricky bit is, um, can I have an objective truth um, in, in, in the sense that it doesn't depend on me in any way? Um, and let me pick another example. There's a tree out the window here. Um, that is true independently of whether I exist or not. It doesn't require me. But of the subjective state of affairs, I have a pain in my knee. I think that is still an objective truth because according to Aristotle's definition, either I have it or I don't have mm -hmm. it. And if I go and say the wrong thing about it, I would have told you the false. Or if I say the right thing about it, I would have told you the truth. Okay. So I guess the next connection is if there's such a thing as objective truth, can we know objective truth? Oh, well, that's, that's one of the things we strive to do. <clears throat> and there are plenty of truths that we can come to know reasonably well. Um, perception is a reliable form of um, getting to know the world. So I see that you're sitting on a chair at the moment, and that is something that I pick up on perceptually. But then there are lots of things that we don't know in that kind of direct perceptual way, like electrons, DNA molecules, all the stuff of science. And there you require much more complicated forms of inference. They will involve observational claims perhaps, but um, we need to have ways of inferring what, from what we can observe to the things that we can't observe. And perhaps we'll never in, be able to observe them like electrons. I don't think um, we'll ever be in a position to see an electron, though you see its effects as soon as you flip the switch over there, the light comes on and you see one of the effects of the flowing of electrons. You don't see the flowing of the electrons, but you see the light. Hmm. So there's the whole business of scientific inference, how you get from what we can observe to things we simply can't observe. Okay. If I were to say, there is objective truth and we have theories that seem to get at what that objective truth is. I guess the next natural question is, but could we ever be certain that what we know is actual objective truth or is it just kind of guessing? So I can imagine with the electrons, I can imagine that that theory works, but the underlying phenomena that's taking place is totally different than what we make it out to be. So can we ever have that kind of confident grasp that we know what it is. Yeah, well, <clears throat> this is a bit more complicated, but uh, let me give you a line that was proposed by Karl Popper. Namely, we can hit on the truth, even though we don't know that we've hit on the truth. Mm -hmm. um, he often speaks about this being a guess, which turns out to be correct. Perhaps that's putting it in too strong a form, but um, there are theories which we propose, which either they're going to be true or they're going to be false. If they're true, we may not be in a position to actually establish their truth. Though we might establish that um, so far they haven't gone wrong, mm -hmm. um, that's okay. But um, there, there can be cases then where we hit on the truth, but we don't have sufficient evidence to actually show that it's true. And quite often in science, that's our position. So um, yes, one quick answer might be, um, yes, there's, uh, there are truths, but we may not be in a position to actually show them to be true, but we may have something else, namely lots of evidence in support of that claim. So the notion of having evidence in support of is quite important here, um, whereas what you want is to be what you wanted before was to be able to verify or establish the truth of these things. Perhaps we can't do that, but um, they may resist our attempts to show them to be false. Okay, so a couple of questions on that. If it's the case that there is a, a gap between the objective truth and the knowing of the objective truth, why would we posit that there is such a thing as objective truth in the first place if we can't ever know what it is? Well, you have to go back to the original definition of what objective um, truth is, namely there's ways the world is independently of 
uh, being present. So, so, so could we challenge, I'll challenge that then. Why, why do we believe that's the case? Okay, um, not to believe that would be to say um, <clears throat> there is no world that is independent of the existence of me or the independent or, or the existence of you. Now, if you think about that, um, you've got a slightly awkward position to explain, say, the history of evolution of things, which is again part of our, our current scientific theory, or our coming into a world which has got certain characteristics when, when we're born and then our departing from it. So if one of us happened to die right now, much of the rest of the world would just go on the way it is. And so the idea of there being an objective world gets a grip at this point where you think of things going on in ways that don't require you to be present. Hmm. When you say that, I think even if it were true that there was no world outside of myself, couldn't we still say that there is objective truth in the sense that however I am, even if I'm the only thing that is, that's the way that I am? Well, take the phrase that you just gave me, um, if, I, if I get it right. Um, <clears throat> there is no world other than the one I'm in. Was, was that the way you put it? Let's or? say that there's no type of existence separate from my existence. Right. Now, you take that to be a truth of some sort. Uh, so that's yes. kind of what I'm asking, is yes. e even in a world, where the only thing that existed was me. Even in such a world, couldn't we still say there is sort of an objective truth in the sense that however well, I am, that's how I am? Well, there is already one, <laughs> namely that um, the world is your subjective experiences. There's a kind of anecdote that comes from Bertrand Russell, where he gave a talk on solipsism. And um, uh, a woman came up to him afterwards and said, I enjoyed your talk on solipsism. I wish there were a lot more of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> and so that, that actually does contain, even though it's a joke, it does contain the seeds of its own refutation because you need to acknowledge that there are things other than you um, around and solipsism, that, that kind of solipsism just isn't going to work. Now, whether you could be a consistent solipsist all around is a difficult philosophical question mm -hmm. that perhaps we can't go into now. But um, I, I, I think it faces certain difficulties of the sort we've just mentioned. Namely, um, you're going to be quite restricted in what the truths are, but you couldn't infer from solips solipsism that there were no truths because you've already given me one, namely everything is solipsistic. Right. And that, that's one of the paradoxes that comes up with relativist truth as well. Yes, that's a natural segue. So one of the things I, I wanted to talk to you about is this notion of relativism. So in my own um, experience in, in uh, getting an undergrad education, it wasn't in philosophy, but the conversations that I had were heavily dominated by what you could call relativists. This notion that there's essentially no such thing as truth. Or truth is relative. It's all about uh, truth we could understand as just statements of your own perspective. There's, there's no truth out there in the world. Mm. And my own disposition is to balk at that. I really don't like that mm. idea. Mm. Um, but I wonder your analysis, if you think that, well, first of all, what is a proper definition of what relativism means? But two, if you think that, as you just said, there's some internal self-refutation within its own theory. Yes, well, this points to a lot of interesting history of philosophy, starting with an encounter between Plato and Protagoras. <laughs> and um, Protagoras um, is reputed to have said that <clears throat> man, meaning human beings, man is the measure of all things, of those things that are that they are, and of those things that are not that they're not. And the thing is to understand what the measure is. And the one way Plato takes this is to say, well, um, I am the standard whereby um, uh, truths are to be accepted. So if um, I say, say, the sun is up at the moment, um, then 
that's true for you, but it, it, it sorry, that's true for me, but it may not be true for you. Um, and then you want to know where you go from there. I mean, how come you get this kind of possibility of um, the same proposition, the sun is up, being true for some person, but false for another? Mm -hmm. And so Plato works around that one and tries to show that there's going to be something self-refuting about it. Now, when you try to follow his argument, it's not always clear, but a lot of other people have had a go at this. And um, I think there is, again, a self-refuting element in it. One of the problems is we've touched on is you can't state the doctrine itself. So if I say all truths are relative right. to whatever, then um, that um, is an objective truth, but the very claim itself un undercuts it. Right. Right. So um, stating the doctrine is difficult. Okay. So two questions. Well, one, one a statement and one a question. I can imagine a circumstance in which somebody can say the sun is up and be talking to somebody and it not be the case that the sun is up if they're talking to somebody on the other side of the world. That could be the case. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, 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 there is something there that's kind of important in that you don't want to rule out all kinds of relativity. Uh, you, you might say, well, relative to your, our being in New Zealand at the moment, the sun is up, but relative to being in Spain, the antipodes of New Zealand, uh, the sun is not up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can sort that problem out. So you don't want to deny all kinds of relativity relative, relative to your position on the earth, the sun is up or it's not up. Right. And, and what you do is kind of complete the statement that you're making, like the sun is up, in New Zealand now, as opposed to the sun is up in Spain now, mm -hmm. the New Zealand one is true, the Spain one is false. And, okay. and, and so you've, you've reasserted absolute truth back in there by uh, specifying the relativizers. Okay. When you use that term absolute truth, does this have a metaphysical implication? So if it's the case that we have access to objective truth, in, even if it's in some limited way, doesn't that imply then that whatever we are, whatever the mind is, is a thing that has access to this perspective, which seems pretty remarkable. Well, um, yes, I think one of the, here I might just appeal to the theory of evolution rather blandly and quickly and say, well, we've evolved as creatures to interact with the world and we've developed perceptual systems that are on the whole in the conditions in which they standardly work are reliable for getting us truths you see so um, I'd want to say that there's a long history of human development that leads us to have the perceptual abilities that we do have that give us contact with the world. Uh, I was just reading the other day that um, <clears throat> uh, whales have genes uh, that if they were back on land, they'd be able to smell. But having evolved from land creatures into the sea and then living in the sea, they have retained these genes, but they no longer use them, not expressed in any way, so they don't smell anything. Hmm. So, so that's interesting evidence for a kind of relativity of perception, depending on um, your genetic makeup and your interaction with the world. Mm -hmm. Again, um, <clears throat> some birds detect um, polarized light, but we don't detect polarized light, but we came to know of it scientifically, I don't know, in the 18th century at some time. So um, polarization is not something we develop, uh, we develop perceptual apparatus to detect, but some birds do have that. Um, but we can come to know about this by, by scientific means. Are there any truths out there that are kind of perception independent entirely? So something like mathematical truths, do you think that those are in another yeah. realm of knowledge? Um, that's, I can give you a quick answer, but it might, it <laughs> might hide a difficult question okay. un, 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 underneath. Um, but first of all, I would rather talk about facts. Um, facts are things in the world. Mm -hmm. 
that make our statements or beliefs true. So there's sort of uh, the truth makers out in the world, facts, if, if you like, and then these beliefs or statements that we make which bear truth. So, I don't know, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, that's something we believe to be true, but what's its truth maker? What's the thing out there that makes it true? Now, uh, a story in the philosophy of mathematics would try to be able to spell this out for you, but, um, or, if, or if I say the number 2 exists, um, that's something we think to be true, but um, what's the f fact, what's the truth maker out there that makes it true? I mean, some kind of weird abstract entity, perhaps. And so when philosophers think about this, they say, well, um, if you think there are these weird kind of things out there, you're postulating uh, a realm that seems to go well beyond the perceptual mm -hmm. and saying that they're what we call abstract entities, but in honour of Plato who first thought about this, we call them Platonistic entities because they're abstract existing entities and numbers are meant to be the classic example. Okay, <laughs> so, so that is a definitely a, a fascinating topic which I love talking about, but it is a little bit, uh, a little bit off topic for our conversation. Um, but I'm very tempted to keep talking about that. Well, I probably can't say much more. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> because you can state the positions here, and then suddenly you go a bit dumb about what, <laughs> what, what further account you can give. You can become anti-Platonistic. Sure, the, the stories you can tell there, but uh, yes, it's an interesting but difficult area. So let's go back to um, this notion of truth and relativism, and we'll tie it back to this idea of post-truth. So. I've never seen the term post-truth before in, in the newspaper, never, nothing mm. even remotely close to that. And I find it really interesting that that kind of phraseology, which has deeply important philosophic implications, mm. is now even in the general public. That's right, yes. <clears throat> well, um, I read about this in the newspaper and there was an item which said the Oxford Dictionaries, in the plural there were several Oxford Dictionaries apparently, had uh, said that um, the word post-truth was their word for 2016. Hmm. You remember a couple of years ago, selfie was, was, <laughs> a, was a word that they acknowledged and put in the dictionary. <laughs> well, post-truth now is going to be in the dictionary. And they mentioned a little bit of history about this, and it goes back to some literary and social critics of about 15 or 20 years ago. They, they, they first used the word. So it made me think about what post-truth might be. And I was a bit puzzled because um, you think of post-truth as what comes after when you get to know the truth. You see, so that's mm. one kind of post-truth. Mm -hmm. And so you've <laughs> discovered something, um, and then what happens when you discover that? I like that definition more. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, but then there's the other thing which says we've gone post-truth when, as the people who put this in, 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 in the dictionary, they said, objective facts are less influential in shaping opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And it struck me that uh, that's a very old thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Objective facts are not so influential. What's in, much more influential is your appeal to emotion and personal belief. And then, because I've studied some Plato, I realized he spoke about this at great length. And so you can say that, um, well, post-truth in this sense emerges when um, people are less willing to look for the truth and pay attention to the evidence for the claims that they make. But they're much more willing to take things because it's emotionally satisfying to believe them or it fulfills their wishes or it gives them power over others, and so on. Now, this sort of thing has been said in philosophy from Plato onwards, that, that there are different ways whereby people can come to get their beliefs. And one way would be to look for evidence for claims. Uh, it's, so you, you, you take a reason or a rational approach. The other way would be to listen to some rhetorician who tries to convince you of some claim, or listen to a lawyer who might be persuasive in a court who tries, tries to get you to accept some claim. 
Now, these are kind of non-rational ways of picking up beliefs. Now, they could also convey things which are true, but they don't actually tell you what the truth basis is. They, they don't come with their evidence on their face, you see. So um, I could get someone to believe anything from science in a non-rational way. You know, like um, uh, some child gets this, we ask a child whether the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun, and they say, uh, well, it's the sun that goes around the earth. And you say, no, no, that's wrong. Stay behind and write it out 500 times <laughs> that, that, that it's, the, it's the earth that goes around the sun. Now, you could pick up that scientific belief that way. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. It happens all the time. So what the post-truth stuff might be saying is that, well, there are truths around, but we can set the evidential, the, the, the evidence for them and the fact that they're truths, we could set that aside. What I want to look, as, look at is the persuasive mechanisms that lead you to believe this that don't depend on evidence and truth. And then we're heading in another direction and um, I think all hell can break loose if you don't keep control of what are the rational grounds for believing. Now when you give that explanation, it makes me think perhaps a better term than post-truth is something like political truth. Because in the, in the sphere of politics, that seems to be, especially as it relates to public discourse, that seems to be the area where you get the least amount of genuine reasoned discourse. It's, it's very much mudslinging mm. and, and come from the states, so we just had this sure. very uh, mm. loud election. Mm that took place where it was very much post-truth by that definition, that nobody right. actually cared about the facts. Not to say that there's no truth in the theory of politics, but in politics in practice, it seems like there's not much to be found. Well, um, yes, I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, so perhaps I wouldn't want to call this political truth so much, but politics is the domain where this will occur most readily. But it can occur in other domains, like um, ad advertising is another good example. <clears throat> so um, political truth, I, I think I'd like to have a, a different qualifier <laughs> other than political there. Post might do, but um, uh, I guess deeply at the bottom, I think uh, the people are not going to agree with this. The differences between rational grounding of beliefs versus non-rational or irrational groundings of mm -hmm. beliefs. And people need beliefs. I mean, we, I think the thing that characterizes us as human beings is we have beliefs. Um, your cat or dog might have a small number of beliefs, um, but uh, we humans seem to have developed brains that produce an infinite number of beliefs. And we need to sort of filter them out, which ones are right and which ones are wrong. But if you, if you never do the rational filtering process, you're just left with these beliefs, how, however you got them mm -hmm. in the first place. So um, I guess I'd like to stick with Plato's idea that there's a rational grounding for belief. And we're going to try to, find, we're going to, try to work hard to find out what that is in some cases mm -hmm. and admit that sometimes... Um, well, we, we don't have a, a, a rational ground, and perhaps it's better to suspend belief at this point. Yeah, this is an excellent segue to the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about. So, in my own background, I was brought up in a Christian evangelical household mm -hmm. where my mother, in particular, was pretty good about saying, you know, there's truth, let's use our reason to, to sort through things. But in, the, in that particular community I was a part of, there was... To, I guess to just to use the terminology that we're using, not necessarily in a pejorative way, there was a lot of non-rational grounding for beliefs, mm. specifically this idea of faith, that right. faith exactly. as a, exactly. some kind of anti-justification for a belief is mm. not only okay, it's something that's admirable. Mm. So I was hoping I could get your analysis on kind of the epistemology of religious beliefs Granted, <clears throat> I don't want to speak in too broad brushstrokes here because I think there is, I've talked to lots of people and I, I have, I'm, have some sort of religious beliefs. I think you can have plenty of 
rationally held beliefs about, let's say, the existence of God is not mm. some self-contradictory idea. But in practice, maybe just like in politics, there's just a, this area of a huge amount of irrationality. Ah, yes. Well, <clears throat> I've been an atheist for as long as I can remember. Uh, in, but insofar as I had a, a religious upbringing as a child, it was Catholic. So I, I know a bit about Catholicism. Um, I don't understand Protestants as a result of that. I don't <laughs> understand why anybody ever wanted to be one. <laughs> Um, but then I lost uh, my faith and I've been without it ever, ever since. But uh, yes, uh, faith seemed to be, it, it's quite often said to be accepting things on grounds that don't involve evidence. Hmm. And so that goes against this idea that, um, that uh, there's a rational basis for your beliefs. Now, in some cases, you can't get the evidence, the, the evidence is gone. So you just make this leap of faith, as I said, mm -hmm. and, and you accept it. Well, looking on the web this last month or so, um, something that I've never really bothered with, but should have, uh, it came up on several different occasions, namely, was there an actual Jesus Christ? Did he exist? And if you believe what is said um, by some of the commentators, um, there is no eyewitness evidence in the Gospels for Christ's existence. Now, if you think about this in a court of law, if you don't have eyewitness people, the case is sort of ended, or you've got hearsay, and hearsay is only acceptable under very limited circumstances. So if this is right, most of what's in the Bible about Jesus Christ is hearsay. Now, it would be a bit much to infer that therefore Christ didn't exist, mm -hmm. but it means that um, you don't have very good evidence. And so the dispute goes on between those who insist on the existence of um, Jesus Christ as a strong matter of faith versus those who want to look at the evidence and find the evidence wanting. Now, one thing I should have mentioned a bit earlier when we came uh, up to the po point of discussing um, scientific evidence is um, I rather like a, th a theory uh, it's called subjective Bayesianism or Bayesianism which is a theory about probabilistic believing and I think it's very important to try to work this out and employ it and what it does it, it sort of gets away from the picture of either we've got something you just believe 100% or it's certain or you disbelieve it 100% uh, or you suspend belief. Now those are possible belief positions mm -hmm. but there's a lot in between and you could say well what is my reasonable degree of belief in this proposition given the evidence that I've got. Now that's sometimes hard to work out and you've got to be super rational but um, I've got interested now in this did Christ exist question, just looking at it from the point of view of saying, well, given the evidence that we've got, what degree of support does it actually give? And how admissible might it be, say, in a, a number of different circumstances like a court of law mm -hmm. or um, a scientific context or a philosophical one? And this does get some discussion in, in the literature. So my overall stance is of somebody who's a Bayesian or, 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 or a person who takes probabilistic believing quite seriously and tries to assess the degree of evidence that you've got. And this can alter over time. Um, some evidence may uh, come in that you didn't know about or some stuff might get overturned mm -hmm. and you then come to know about. Um, it's important to then keep your beliefs um, alive in this way in respect of the evidence that you've got. <coughs> So I guess when it comes to the question of um, the specific one about uh, the existence of Jesus, as far as I can tell at the moment of the evidence that there is, it's a low degree of belief. Uh, I can't actually say that he doesn't exist, but um, or never existed. But um, so, so that would be an interesting example to apply the theory of probabilistic uh, believing. And I think this goes all the way through the sciences as well. Mm -hmm. So when Plato talks about uh, evidence and uh, truth and so on, uh, I'd like to 
put on there something he didn't um, really think about, namely a probabilistic theory of reasoning. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So mm -hmm. would you say in terms of the, the kind of the methodology of faith as a process for coming to one's beliefs, would you say that and understood in, in that way as kind of the absence of evidence or the absence of reason, would you say that there is this, they're like kind of diametrically opposed. You have faith on one end, which mm. is belief without mm. the evidence. Mm. Then you have rational analysis on the other and you just can't mix that. They're almost categorical definitional opposites. Or is right. that too well, strong? Well, you do try to bring them together in, in some way. And sometimes the twain never, the twain never, never meets. There's um, a kind of story that's said about uh, the development of philosophy of religion in the medieval period um, that uh, um, some of the best philosophy of religion was actually being written by Muslims um, based on Greek texts. And so scholars in Europe got to know the Greek texts and they read the Muslims and they thought, well, we, we need to give better arguments for our faith than what's um, just accepting what's in the scripture. So you get people like Aquinas who took his task to be, um, to give um, Christianity a kind of rational foundation mm -hmm. based on lots of things that you would find in Aristotle and Plato, particularly Aristotle. Uh, so there you find someone who wants to, wants to get uh, reason and faith to meet in, in some way. So when you use the term faith in that context, you're kind of talking about the end conclusions versus a methodology. So the Thomistic approach would be, let's have the rational method, mm. but apply towards these particular conclusions. That's right. You, you're yeah. not going to, in, in the end, for it didn't work out for Aquinas, but um, you, you try to push the boundaries of rationality as far as they will go. And he came up with all sorts of proofs about the existence of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, the five proofs are just some of them, are the five ways. But, but there you find someone trying to do something you just don't find in the Bible. You don't find uh, in the Christian tradition itself outside those influenced by, by philosophy, like much earlier on Augustine. So um, there are things in the Bible that people want to, to have accepted and maybe there are no further grounds than faith, which I think is the line adopted by St. Paul because he realized there was a big gap between what he was expected to believe and what the evidence was he had. And mm. so the category of faith uh, became very important for him. So with religious beliefs, there's obviously a lot of different propositions that people analyze. The existence of Jesus Christ would be one, and did he is it a story? Was he an actual person? What did he actually say? How are the reliability of the text? Mm. All the way through theological claims, like, um, you know, love is something that's divine, or there's a million different theological claims. So I know a lot of people, like in my own personal progression, I started with the, in the evangelical world, I discovered philosophy, you might say, or just discovered the rational methodology, thought, no, this is the way to mm. do things entirely as a function of that. I lost my beliefs. But just a few years ago, I've kind of rediscovered not the theology and certainly not the method of faith, but I've rediscovered some conclusions specifically about love. I think love mm. is this really, really big deal. And then I find, oh, this is what Christianity, not in terms of it as a historical text, such and such a happen, but when you actually read what they're talking about, about how important love is and why it's like, the meaning of life for human beings, essentially. I find it very persuasive, just for purely rational, uh, rationalist arguments. And what I have found, all of these major religions seem to point at the same type of truth, the same type of rational claims, you know, uh, peace on earth and goodwill toward men, something like that. That's, is that pointing at some ethical truths that you could say are actually do stand up to rigorous um, rational analysis? Well, I think, um, you know, the injunction, let's all try to be decent and nice to one another <laughs> instead of horrid and nasty, <laughs> is, a, is a reasonable principle to adopt. And um, I think atheists could endorse it just as much as uh, believers might. Um, 
I mean, believers might want to reinforce those moral attitudes um, for various reasons, because they tie them to belief in God, but atheists would want to make a disconnection there and say, well, okay, I mean, you could imagine forms of life in which we're beast, beastly and nasty to one another and there's enough of it around. Um, what are you going to prefer just as a matter of the kind of creature that you are, what, what you want out of life? Mm -hmm. And you could give this a religious gloss or not, as the case may be. Now, there's a lot to be said for the kinds of things Christians want to talk about in the case of love, and you've discovered some of it, and so that's, that's interesting to read. But what, when I look at this, I think, well, um, well, atheists have not been around very long. <laughs> Only the last couple of hundred years have atheists been able to do their thing. What, what went on before um, is a complex matter. Um, but um, atheists um, haven't really developed doctrines of love, but they still want to talk about having good communities and good relationships between people. And that's something that they could endorse and the ethics of it doesn't have to be tied to religion at all. Mm -hmm. mm. So on that note, something that I found interesting um, about this the post-truth discussion, from my experiences just in the past decade or so, the philosophic arguments about post-truth relativism seem to be coming almost exclusively from those individuals who were politically affiliated on the left of the traditional left-right spectrum. And that seemed to change very quickly, this whole post-truth thing. Now, the lamenting of the idea of post-truth mm -hmm. seems to be coming largely from that same group of people. Like I know some um, uh, philosophy professors and political theory um, professors who I feel like five years ago, if we were talking, they would essentially say, yeah, truth is relative. There's no such thing as objective truth. And now in a matter of a couple of months, they're saying they're lamenting this idea mm -hmm. that the general public has lost access to objective truth. Uh, now, is that, do you, have you, do you share the same well, perception? I think that's a very interesting point about what happened because um, a kind of skepticism about truth has crept in. Um, it's the 20th century, I guess, and it's progressed. And even people on the left um, adopted skeptical positions on this. <clears throat> if you read some of the theoreticians in this area, they weren't skeptics about truth at all. Um, but anyway, um, we won't discuss that. But, 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 but certainly there's a kind of lazy tolerance, if you like, where you're, you're accepting of anything and you don't want to upset people. And then you question the whole idea of truth and you become a relativist. Hmm. And, um, and then tolerance comes along with it. But I think that's quite wrong. Uh, but of course, your, your point is quite correct. And now the, now the post-truth thing emerges and they're outraged, but they've lost completely their view of what real truth is. You see, they're, they're, someone has to start all over again with this. Um, that's why Plato is interesting. He recognized that every generation you've got to do this again and again. <laughs> and that's why Socrates as a teacher is, is so important because he talked to people and got them to discuss these issues. So one has to um, rejig the ideas of truth and actually say, well, some views of truth were just completely wrong and you shouldn't have adopted them. Hmm. So this little article I wrote about um, f fake news in the post-truth era I mentioned three philosophers, um, uh, Richard Rorty, uh, <clears throat> who has a compl complicated ideas about truth, but he said some things that always outraged me. And then there's Nietzsche, who um, adopted a position of perspectivism, but also said things like there are no facts and uh, there's just pers perspectives. And then I mentioned Michel Foucault, the French sort of sociologist come, come philosopher who, um, when you read his stuff, he's very evasive. I think towards the end, he was heading in the right direction. Hmm. But I think in the middle period, when he spoke a lot about knowledge and power and regimes of truth and so on, that, that stuff was outrageous. Yeah. Yet all this has infected 
the academic world. Yeah. And uh, I've always found that disturbing. I wrote articles against Foucault and so on, but um, I don't know who took much notice. <laughs> Every once in a while I get a comment on them. Uh, but, but I think all this has to be revisited and what these guys have said has to be deeply questioned. Now, I have a friend <clears throat> in the United States who is a Nietzsche scholar, and it was she who wrote a couple of very good short pieces on this post-truth business, and it got me going in, in, in this. Uh, and what she wanted to do was, def was to defend Nietzsche. And, the, and while I quite liked what she wrote, uh, I thought, well, um, no, defending Nietzsche is perhaps not the way to go here. Mm -hmm. uh, he needs to be criticised. And there's, um, there's, there's, there's no evading this point because it's quite central and important. So even though I like what, she, what she's done, um, I feel that I can't support Nietzsche in this, not, not, not that I ever had, but um, it's, it, it's something that needs to be done over again. I don't quite know how you do it, but it needs to be done. That was very interesting. You, I like the term uh, lazy tolerance. Do you think, again, I can only draw from my experiences and conversation that I've had, conversations that I have with people in the American university system, but there does seem to be a very tight connection between the ideas that we don't want to upset people, we want to, be, we want to tolerate people, and therefore it is antisocial to say you're wrong. You know, there is objective truth and you've made a poor argument here and this is why. So there's some, so it is almost in a sense more socially tolerant and, um, I don't know, popular is not the right word, but uh, all inclusive maybe is the right word. If you it's, abandon it's, the idea. It's accepting. It's, it's accepting, it's exactly. It's wanting to be accepting. Um, perhaps when I use the word Perhaps I shouldn't have used the word tolerance, but that this is what is said in the context mm -hmm. of r relative truth is that it helps promote tolerance. Yeah. And, and that's something that mm. I think is wrong. But um, um, it, provo it promotes acceptance. Now, now, the reason I think it's wrong is when you think about the notion of tolerance, what, what, what does it mean? And I think it's got three components. One is you seriously object to something. But the second thing is, you don't do anything about the stuff you object to. You put up with it. Hmm. And then the third thing, this is where the philosophy gets into the story, is you need some philosophical justification of why you don't act against something you've got objections to. Mm -hmm. But the thing about tolerance, um, if, if you take this, this, this definition, is you've got a strong objection, but you don't try to suppress those who are, who've got that view. You, mm -hmm. co you continue to live with them and deal with them. So the kind of example I had in mind was, um, say the 1900, you, next door is a homosexual couple. You go and call the police immediately. <laughs> you mm -hmm. can't stand their, their, their behavior. <clears throat> um, 1950, um, you become tolerant in the sense that there's this homosexual behavior going on next door. You don't like it, but you don't call the police. You don't try to stop it mm -hmm. in any way. And then the year 2000, homosexuals next door, you're accepting of the whole thing. You've dropped, dropped your objection. And so what tolerance requires is you have got some serious objection. Whereas accepting the homosexual couple next door, it's not a matter of tolerance. It's just accepting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you think about the notion of tolerance, uh, I need to modify carefully uh, what I said about it, but that's sometimes the word is used in the context of um, being being accepting. But I think that's probably wrong. But but I gave you that quick example of the homosexuals next door to show how attitudes can change mm -hmm. from being intolerant to being tolerant to tolerance not mattering. It's it's something else is going on. So do you think in regards to philosophy, perhaps the mistake is going from tolerance to acceptance of poor ideas or relativism or, or, or the idea that I will tolerate, mm -hmm. uh, tolerate strict, mm -hmm. strict language, poor argumentation, but I will not accept it. And do you think that that line um, has been blurred? In the sense I, I that think it's not uh, in the case of argumentation, I wouldn't tolerate it. 
Um, I, I think um, uh, because you can, you can redress the whole thing, but I think in a social context where you've got objections to what uh, others are doing, you need to also take into account some other principles about freedom and, and so on, mm. and uh, the liberties of others to do do things, even though you may have your objections, and, and you've got to settle that somehow or other. Mm. So, so a tolerant society is a complex one where there are things going on in it you definitely don't like, but you hope that the liberal framework will survive it because you're willing to, um, well now there's a word, got to be careful about respect. <laughs> I have another thing about respect um, that's important, I think, but you, you, you still want to preserve a, a liberal framework, whereas if you're going to be intolerant, you're not accepting what they're doing and, and you're trying to stop it. Hmm. Mm. So I, I think those are complex things to think about, perhaps to think about more carefully than I've expressed them now um, as part of the background politics of, of this. But certainly I wouldn't want to employ relative truth as a way of uh, indicating tolerance. Uh, I think that's wrong. I, I just want to say, you know, there are some things that on the basis of the evidence you've got, what is there is just wrong. Okay. Well, on that note, I really appreciate the conversation. This has been great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good questions and good to talk to you. All right, that was my conversation with Professor Robert Nola. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure to stay tuned next week. I've got another really awesome interview for you and a cool story to share with you. And like I said at the beginning of the show, if you'd like to hear shorter form presentations that are about five minutes long, me talking about issues that I haven't focused a great deal on on this podcast, then go to youtube.com slash Steve Patterson and subscribe to my channel there. I'm releasing weekly videos that if you're interested in philosophy, you're guaranteed to enjoy. All right, that's all for today. I'll talk to you guys next week.